recognized for five minutes. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate the invitation. I'm not sure who the ladies are to my left, but I'd wish to acknowledge them. I don't know what you're doing, but it is fascinating to watch you do it, <laughs> honestly. Uh, back in 2011, the Transportation and Commerce Committee invited me to share my thoughts on how to close America's widening skills gap. So I came to this building to talk about a critical part of the solution most often overlooked by politicians and educators. That would be the pressing need for better PR. I talk specifically about the stigmas and stereotypes that dissuade millions of people from exploring thousands of genuine opportunities in the skilled trades and the urgent need to challenge those myths and misconceptions. I pointed out that President Obama's promise of three million shovel-ready jobs sounded great, but I worried that filling those jobs would be challenging, especially in a country where fewer and fewer people aspired to pick up a shovel. I concluded by telling the committee that millions of open positions will remain unfilled until society changes its opinion on the definition of a good job. And then I invited those present to join me in a larger effort to do that very thing. Shortly after my testimony to the committee, the skills gap closed, unemployment plummeted, and America got back to work. I'm kidding. Shortly after my testimony, the skills gap widened, unemployment grew, and society continued to ignore thousands of opportunities that comprise a critical part of our workforce. So a few years later, I was invited back to the Hill to address the Natural Resources Committee and talk more about the causes of our widening skills gap. This time, I focused on the unintended consequences of promoting a four-year degree as the best path for the most people. There was a time when higher education needed a PR campaign, and it got one. Unfortunately, the push for four-year institutions came at the expense of community colleges, trade schools, and apprenticeship programs. Thus, every other educational opportunity began to feel subordinate. Also, the overall push for college coincided with an overall removal of vocational arts from high schools across the country, and the effects of that one-two punch laid the foundation not just for a widening skills gap, but for a level of student debt that's massive, premature, and completely unnecessary. I testified that tuition had soared in part because thousands of well-intended parents and guidance counselors were telling millions of kids, irrespective of their individual skills, that their best hope of success was the most expensive path available. The pressure on kids to borrow money was enormous, and so they did. Consequently, college tuition rose faster than the cost of food, energy, real estate, and health care. I also shared some personal stories with the committee that day, including a run-in with my own guidance counselor 35 years earlier. In 1980, Mr. Dunbar did everything in his power to dissuade me from attending a local community college. I was told outright that a two-year school was beneath my potential. But a four-year school would have been a huge mistake at that point in my life, I was 17 years old, I had no money, and I had no idea of what I wanted to do. The local community college offered hundreds of courses in my price range, so that's where I went, and that experience opened doors that I didn't even know existed. But that same experience is precisely what thousands of kids are discouraged from pursuing every single year. I told the committee then that this cookie-cutter approach to promoting higher education has led thousands of graduates with expensive degrees from excellent schools, but with no prospects in their chosen field and no way to pay off their student loans. With the universal push for a four-year degree more intense than ever, I argued then that our skills gap is the direct result of a mistaken belief that the best path for the most people is a four-year degree. And I concluded with another appeal to aggressively confront the stigmas and stereotypes that discourage people from entering the trades, along with the challenge to guidance counselors to present a more balanced presentation of educational alternatives beyond high school. After my testimony in 2013, the skills gap closed. Public education re-embraced the vocational arts. College tuition returned to affordable levels, and America finally got back to work. I'm kidding. That was fascinating. Shortly after my testimony, the skills gap got even wider, tuition got even more expensive, and guidance counselors continued to use a career in the trades as a cautionary tale for those who resisted a four-year degree. 
Now the situation has devolved even further, and my own mother has concluded that I am part of the problem. The more you testify, she said to me last night, the worse things get. <laughs> she may be right. Today the skills gap is wider than it's ever been. 5.6 million jobs, according to the BLS. Vocational education is still missing from an overwhelming majority of high schools. Bills like the one before this committee still meet resistance in part because millions of Americans still view a career in the trades as some kind of vocational consolation prize. It's a bias, as misguided as any other prejudice with us today, and it poses a clear and present danger to our country's overall economic security. The student loan bubble is going to burst, as bubbles always do. Currently, the outstanding debt is $1.3 trillion, and yet we continue to lend money we don't have to kids who can't pay it back, to teach them jobs that no longer exist while ignoring all kinds of careers that actually do. In Springfield, Massachusetts, right now, there are tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs available, yet the unemployment rate in Springfield is just as high as it is in the rest of the state. The mismatch between available skilled jobs and the unemployed local population is enormous, and it's happening everywhere. And so at the risk of making things worse, I have come here today to address the House Committee on Education and Workforce. Alas, I have nothing new to tell you.